afternoon and good evening colleagues a very warm welcome to the 10th cafe knowledge cafe of the ippn network uh, before we start i'd like to highlight a few housekeeping rules kindly please keep your microphones muted so the rest of us can hear the presenters and the panelists and speakers uh, for those who would like to access uh, on you know real-time captioning you can activate it using the Zoom settings, or you can look in your chat box and find the stream text link so that you can access the captions on a separate web page. Um, there's also international sign interpretation for this event today. Um, and, and with that, I think um, it's a great moment for us to launch into this tense discussion of the integrated uh, policy practitioners network, uh, which, as many of you will know, uh, is an initiative of 10 founding UN entities uh, that was created really to create uh, to, um, to create a shared space, a shared community space for us to exchange lessons, to exchange experiences, and to collectively build our capacities uh, on integrated policy support for the operationalization of the 2030 agenda. In our discussion today, we're going to talk about intersectionality and then how to adopt an intersectional lens or an intersectional approach in the implementation of the 2030 agenda, and more specifically, how to advance disability inclusion through an intersectional lens uh, so that we can ensure that no one is left behind. Um, it is quite clear increasingly that without an intersectional approach, uh, there is a very high chance that we will leave behind uh, several of the people or groups or communities that we aim to serve. Uh, and it is absolutely critical for us to adopt an intersectional approach in order for us to ensure that there is substantive equality experienced by all. Uh, but before I hand over to our esteemed speakers uh, this morning, um, let me first introduce myself quickly. Uh, my name is Sri Rupa Mitra. I will be moderating uh, the event and the discussion today. Uh, I am located at, in the culture and diversity team as the disability inclusion manager in the office of the executive director at UNICEF. Uh, and it's a great pleasure for me uh, to, uh, you know, both in my current role uh, and as having been involved in intersectionality discussions in my previous role at the UN Partnership on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities uh, to be participating with all of you on this discussion. Uh, before I start, I would like you all to think about, you know, the multiple identities that we all have, that each one of us has, and the nature of intersectional experiences that that creates for us. Uh, and more importantly, think about um, the people and the communities that we serve and the multiple identities um, that those people have and those communities have and the intersectional discrimination that they may experience on account of that. Uh, so with that, I would like to start and by introducing our esteemed panelists this morning. So let me start by introducing uh, my dear colleague, Leila Sharafi, who is the UNFPA gender, Global Gender Equality Advisor and the Global Disability Inclusion Focal Point. Uh, Lola is, you know, is part of the UN system with more than eight, 18 years of experience, having worked at UNFPA, UNFPA UN, UFM before that, and the executive office of the UN Secretary General, uh, in addition to the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. So we're very excited to have Lola on the panel and to hear her inputs from UNFPA. We also have Dr. Munjul Kabir, uh, who is the UN Coordination Advisor, as well as the Gender and Disability, uh, Disability Inclusion Lead at UN Women. Munjul is a human rights lawyer uh, and brings extensive experience and expertise on human rights, but also on gender uh, responsive development. Um, so with that, let me hand over first to Leila. Uh, Leila will sort of um, set the scene for us in terms of why it's important to have an intersectional approach and what does it really mean and how UNFPA has really operationalized that in their overall strategic thinking. Over to you, Leila. Thank you so much, Sri Rupa, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure and honor to be here with you today. Thank you for the invitation. I'm pleased to be sharing the stage with wonderful colleagues and speakers um, about today's session on intersectionality, particularly for disability inclusion. 
Um, at UNFPA for the last six years, we've really been thinking about models, tools, approaches to address discrimination and violence um, by people really living at the center of where gender, age, and disability, for example, intersect. Uh, so for us, much of the work has really centered on obviously our mandate, which is uh, strengthening sexual and reproductive health and rights and addressing gender-based violence. Um, but we know that, for example, next slide, please. Persons with disabilities, and, and no surprise to many of you who, here today, and especially the speakers, um, we know that persons with disabilities face um, human rights violations in, 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 in high levels and, and face very high risks. Um, for example, in our institution, we talk a lot about the high risk of gender-based violence that women with disabilities face, up to 10 times more according to one study. We know that young people with disabilities also face up to four times more violence than, than their peers without disabilities. And in our line of work, we are constantly talking about the fact that young women and girls, so again, that intersection of age, gender, and disability, have some of the lowest levels of sexual and reproductive health information and education. So really, it's, it's, um, it's, it's showing um, how we as UNFPA has been, have been putting this particular set of intersections at the forefront. Next slide, please. Now, the challenge with intersectionality and the intersectional approach, and um, my colleague Wanda Rua will talk a lot about, um, you know, this approach and, 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 and about how it's being applied in their institution and thinking about its application, but it's fine at the conceptual level, but operationally, how does it work? And, and we've been hearing a lot of questions from the field about, Thank you for you know <laughs> highlighting the importance of leaving no one behind. We get it, but how do, how does it work, right? And how do we make sure that at the practical programmatic level we can apply this? And and it's really critical that we get it right because it is a necessary tool for development if we want to be nuanced about our approaches and and making sure that we're addressing all forms of inequalities um, and and being really as effective as possible. So to align to our current strategic plan, as Rupa said at UNFPA, uh, we've been thinking about how do we make this practical and operational. So we've developed what we call the leaving no one behind and reaching furthest behind operational plan. Now this plan really presents us with opportunities for inclusion of um, different population groups that have been historically excluded, but persons with disabilities um, including in our work. Um, but we also want to think about other factors, uh, obviously. Um, and we have come up with this uh, eight global core furthest behind factors, which is the diagram that you see here. And it shows how this quote gender plus, right? So thinking about the gender lens, which is historically something we've always done in UNFPA, given our mandate focused on SRHR and gender equality being such a core part of that, um, to, to then overlay with these other potential uh, furthest behind factors. And we wanted to start using the phrase furthest behind because reaching the furthest behind is focused on situations where gender and other exclusionary factors really come together to create this disadvantage. Um, and, and, and allowing us to think of factors rather than groups or population groups per se, um, it allows us to think that, well, a factor is a characteristic, right? That drives discrimination. And then you can start to see how different factors um, come together and become drivers of exclusion, right? Of the same person or the same group. Um, and this helps us to shift from seeing um, or avoid seeing discrete groups rather in a narrow and limited way and to rather reflect the reality of intersectional disadvantage. Um, so, you know, well, key concrete steps for making this particular approach work for us has, have been really in the plan to outline that you need disaggregated data to the extent possible to see who these uh, furthest behind um, groups, but then the factors really um, are, are, are captured in the data or not. We know that making the invisible visible is very challenging, but this is something that we will continue to advocate for. Um, I think the other main thing that we 
and no surprise here, as part of a human rights-based approach is strengthening voice and partnerships, including CSOs. Um, and then really talking a lot about addressing root causes. Um, and then for us, since we work in public health, um, in the service provision area, making sure that we use the rights-based standard for service provision, which is making sure services are available, accessible, acceptable, and a quality standard. Um, and for us, there have been very specific strategies and initiatives that have helped us to kind of concretize this, right? And one of them is our youth strategy, which we call my body, my life, my world. Um, and that very much looks at how adolescents and youth face particular vulnerabilities when it comes to SRHR, including, again, different groups like persons with disabilities or young people with disabilities. Um, we, we have the We Decide program, which is a specific program that uh, tries to, again, make that programmatic. Um, we have work on persons of African descent, uh, as well as some work that has been going on for quite some time on indigenous peoples, particularly women and girls with regards to maternal health, again, violence, again, family planning, et cetera. So it's just a little taste of kind of what we're trying to do to make it a little more concrete. We've also finally, to cap it off, we've developed a um, furthest behind an LNOB marker, which will allow us to tag all of our activities quite like the gender marker. So we can start to see where our offices are actually focusing on these different factors. And we're hoping that in our programs, our offices will at least start to mark at least three different factors in the different programs that they're, they're working to implement. So I'll stop there, but happy to take questions and back to you, Sri Rupa. Thank you so much, Leila. Um, and I think one of the things that you highlighted is very critical. Uh, as we speak more and more of inclusion, we, we're still focusing a lot on siloed approaches on focusing on specific groups that does not take into account the intersectional nature of the experience of discrimination, as well as the multiple uh, discriminations that people face. Um, and I and I, I think it was important um, that you know the, that you mentioned that you are uh, making policies and programs based on factors for marginalization, uh, as opposed to necessarily only groups. Um, so with that, uh, I will now hand over uh, to Montreal. But before I do that, I just want to remind participants, uh, please do enter your questions, comments, insights, experiences in the chat box. Uh, we have colleagues who are monitoring the chat box uh, and after the panelists have spoken, uh, and we've had a few country, level, country colleague reflections, uh, we will open up the floor for uh, discussion and for responding to your questions. Um, so with that, Manjuru, let me hand over to you. Uh, and if you can share with us uh, how UN Women is looking at intersectionality, uh, how the broader UN system could apply an intersectional approach in a more systematic way, uh, particularly at the UN country team level. Over mm. to you, Manjuru. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Sirupa. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, my colleague, uh, Leila already set the tone, and I think that um, already explained the need for intersectionality, so I would not focus on that. I would focus on operationalization challenges. Uh, I think the question that Sherupa you mentioned and um, Leila alluded to, we, we heard a lot of times from the field because there are a lot of approaches out there for UN system, and I would rather go for a UN system approach rather than UN women, because that is where the system is facing challenges in terms of developing a coherent narrative for leaving no one behind. Now, at the outset, I want to just say two things. One is we do not need a add and star approach, rather a full shift of mindset for, uh, mind, my, mindset for this, uh, because there's no such thing as one single issue struggle nowadays. We do not live a single issue life. And therefore, our intersecting challenges and identities also have deeper impact on what we do on the ground with our development programming or supporting member state. Or if you think about from the member state's point of view, how they are really developing their programming for the people whom my colleague mentioned are furthest behind. 
Now, intersectionality is not a panacea, of course, like any other approach, but it is an analytical framework for analysis, integrated policy development and implementation. It applies an intersectional lens to connect our human rights instruments to address the multiple forms of discrimination that people experience. And of certainly it promotes disability inclusion among others, all other factors are intersecting identities. It also provides a excellent opportunity of meta networking for our UN city country teams uh, who needs to get engaged with organization of person with disabilities, because without that, uh, our work on intersector uh, intersectionality or work on gender or work on other movements um, would not be complete. It also involves civil society members, member states and other partners wherever they are relevant. And the whole aspect of SDG integration where we are facing a challenge of how to develop a consistent narrative for leaving no one behind system wide. This intersection approach uh, helps us development of the implementation and evaluation of policies and program, particularly the data based information and analysis to identify effectively. It's not about competing identities. It's also about identifying who is facing at what part of their life particular challenges. Remember one thing, privilege and discrimination can be faced by same individual in their life as they are moving into at different phases. So it's not that, that poverty stricken people are only facing discrimination or rich people are not facing any challenges at all. So intersectionality, look at from that angle, it does not create a particular boxed approach where you are privileged, you are particularly uh, <coughs> discriminated against. Now, intersectionality lens, uh, look at human rights instruments. And of course, people experiencing multiple form, forms of discrimination. And then they try to uh, work on the substantive equality inclusion and leave no one behind. I would rather uh, categorize this as more inclusion agenda. In the next slide, okay, here comes the key issues as our my colleagues also alluded to. The, how do you operationalize this? Now, it starts from, of course, the analysis, as I mentioned. Uh, political economy analysis has factored some of the elements, not all, but we need to design whatever programs that UN programming we call or the policy intervention, whether it is higher level or it is at the local level that take into account power relation and social structures. So that is where UN city has a critical role. I'm emphasizing that because sometimes we are captured by elites in the capital and we don't go beyond capital in many cases, especially in terms of selecting our partners. The structural nature of inequality, uh, to have an in-depth understanding of the structure that produce different identities, understanding of the context of the existing inequalities and their history. That is also important in terms of providing an analytical frame of our UN uh, planning tools, whether it is common country assessment, whether it is overall country programming that we are agreeing with the host government. And then, of course, moving from categorizing groups to vulnerabilities of individuals. As I mentioned, that privilege and discrimination are not necessarily faced by separate people. The same individual or groups or uh, vulnerabilities can create these two different distinct experience. Now, developing target, targeted uh, intervention and building knowledge uh, Repository on intersectory is critical. Here I would talk about briefly that what UN Women is planning to do for the UN system. One is of course providing the consistent knowledge base, which we have already did through our global toolkit. We also launched a policy brief on rule of law, justice, peace and security and intersectionality. That's a separate publication where we particularly look in, looked at peace and uh, conflict context and how intersectionality can make a difference. Uh, you can uh, find them available in UN Women website, but my colleague Eva might share that in the chat box also the, uh, in the link. We also need to promote uh, different groups. Uh, and when I'm saying different groups, I'm talking about gender movement, I'm talking about disability movement, I'm talking about uh, indigenous people's movement, because 
what we are seeing the missing link between different movements and their interrelations. An intersectional approach essentially highlight that building that relations stronger. And of course, data collection and analysis is a critical part of this. Next slide, please. Now, I mentioned about the resource guide and toolkit. This is what many colleagues, particularly the UN cities, uh, demanded because they, when they are presenting this framework to the host government, to the civil society partner, to private sector, they all talk about a consistent UN guidance and uh, together with many other UN agencies uh, and organization of persons with, uh, persons with disabilities and, and other groups, we come up with this resource guide. Now, this is the first step. And I mentioned that we also, we're coming up with also separate thematic policy brief, but it can connect you to uh, intersecting inequalities and identities, identities faced by people experiencing diverse and compounded from some discrimination. This could be guidance for both member states, UN cities and OPDs. And I'm very glad that uh, my colleague Nigina from Moldova is here uh, because uh, Moldova UN city reviewed the early draft to provide us feedback as well as, well as a few other countries uh, at, at the UN city level. Uh, next slide, please. Now, these are the four areas where we shed light on. One is, of course, to introduce intersectionality uh, for UN system, but also for non-UN partner as well. We have eight intersectionality enabler, and we introduced with key questions so that we can apply them as we are uh, planning, as we are budgeting, as we are developing program, and as we are looking into advocacy initiative with host government or member states. Uh, we are also trying to give you an action framework to apply an intersectional approach in any stage or process, whether it is in the planning or in the implementation. Practical examples we also try to give in each of the eight intersectional categories. And then we basically developed a menu of services and toolbox. This is critical because this responds to the how question, particularly for the practitioners who want to adapt and implement as part of intersection approach. I want to finish my presentation just to remind you as I start my presentation saying that we don't leave a one single issue and we don't face a one single struggle. And therefore intersectionality really presented as the context and forces us to go beyond our individual identity, our individual privilege and our individual lifestyle. And I would urge all of you who joined today, particularly the UN city members, OPDs and other UN entities members, please also uh, do an intersectionality assessment for your own organization before you roll out any program because try to find out whether there are discrimination privileges of your mindset are also affecting your programming and thinking at the country level. Because sometimes our bias reflected on our programming. And that is what core of intersectionality identify our individual bias before you try to suggest others. Thank you very much, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Manjro. Um, that was very insightful and I think also helpful for colleagues on the call today. Uh, to find entry points uh, in terms of going forward in uh, you know, assessing you know, how far they're able to adopt or currently adopting an intersectional approach and potentially what is the forward trajectory in ensuring a more intersectional approach to both our policymaking and programming and also how, uh, how, we, you know, how we are as organizations in terms of uh, you know, how we recognize diversity within the organization. Um, I think one of the things that was critical in your uh, in your presentation was that we we need to come up with a more synergized uh, UN system wide approach to intersectionality uh, and potentially you know what are the entry points uh, entry points for that uh, whether it's the you know the the, the common country assessment that happens uh, in the development of the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework uh, or more specifically within the strategic planning. Uh, and process of each of the UN entities. Uh, so with that, I think this is, um, this is the right moment to actually also hear from colleagues uh, from the UN country team level. Uh, so we have from UNFPA, 
uh, Lola Valadares, who is the National Officer for uh, Interculturality uh, and Human Rights at UNFPA in Ecuador and, and gender as well. Uh, Lola, over, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, colleagues. Good morning. Greetings from Ecuador. Uh, I am sorry because I had a problem with my connection, but uh, I am here. Um, I, I'd like uh, to share with you um, a presentation. Uh, and, uh, okay. Well, uh, I um, will, will share with you an experience uh, that we are working in uh, Otavalo, which is uh, indigenous soon. And in this place, we are uh, working um, on disability, gender, and interculturality in order to improve the prevention and response of GBV. Ecuador is a multi ethnic, uh, ethnic and a multicultural country, um, but uh, we also have uh, high levels of uh, gender based violence. 65 of every 100 women have experienced GBV. And regarding to um, uh, women with disabilities, uh, it is uh, good to say that 80% uh, um, of uh, Ecuadorian women uh, with disability uh, and our mothers have their first, their first child in adolescence and youth, 3% of them had their first child between 10 and 12 and 14 years old. So this is linked to sexual violence. 43% had their first child between uh, 15 and 19 years old. Um, according to the constitution, uh, the persons with disability are priority groups. There have uh, been advances in laws and policies However, there are gaps, especially in GBV protection and services. And in this context, uh, um, Ecuador, the global program we decide, which will promote the rights of adolescents, young people, especially girls and women with disabilities, uh, to access to a life free of gender-based violence and enjoy their sexual and reproductive rights and health. Uh, we have had the three actions uh, uh, for this uh, uh, intervention. The, facts, uh, the first one, uh, we did a diagnosis about the current situation of rural indigenous women with disabilities regarding the, to the access to GBV care and services in Otavalo. Uh, the for the response, uh, we developed a protocol uh, and methodology for women indigenous um, with disabilities to access to gender-based violence services and protection and especially with their participation. And the third one is strengthening the capacities of the Otavalo municipality and the council for the protection of rights uh, on GBV prevention and response. Regarding to the diagnosis, um, we have uh, um, done some findings uh, for example, the absence of disaggregated indicators and figures on ethics, self-identification, disabilities, and age. Um, in the Otavalo Canton, um, there are uh, 2,669 people with disabilities registered. Uh, the 44% are women. However, we think uh, these figures uh, are not um, um, showing the complete uh, uh, population. Um, there are difficulties to detect GBV and uh, obviously to respond to GBV. Um, the women with disabilities especially are dedicated to the housework, the animal care and crafts uh, according to their possibilities. Uh, they have a little or no interaction with their community and society, and the institutions to support GBV survivors are uh, not accessible enough, especially in health, justice, and police. 
and the uh, women and the indigenous women with disabilities uh, have also facing another barriers. Uh, they um, uh, face double and triple vulnerability uh, because of their gender, disabilities, age, ethnicity, rurality, among others. Uh, the access to communication. Lola, Lola, sorry. So this is Shreerupa. Lola, if we, could, we have another minute for you to perhaps, sorry. if you wanted to focus on some of the, uh, you know, the key sort of reflections from your experience, we will be sharing the slides. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can see the the, the barriers that the women face, and uh, we are addressing um, those barriers, uh, especially uh, in order to improve the. Um, the response to GBV and we developed a protocol and the protocol has a content regarding to legal framework, gender-based violence and the institutional roles. Through this protocol, we are uh, trying to improve uh, the capacities of the institutions in order to uh, address the situation of the triple discrimination and the intersectional vulnerabilities of the, of the indigenous uh, women with disabilities. Um, this is, uh, we also developed a referral pathways for GBV services in order to uh, women um, to, to women with disabilities to facilitate their um, um, attention uh, in situations of GBV. Finally, I would like to say that um, as, uh, as you see, they uh, face many barriers, but uh, through our work, we are uh, trying uh, to address them in order to improve um, the capacities of the local government as well as of the um, women uh, with disabilities. Finally, I would like to show uh, with uh, some uh, inclusive communication products that we have developed. For example, we have this video about the referral pathway on GBV that is in Quechua and signals language. The same with the uh, law to uh, prevent and respond to GBV. Um, these are some of our key actions uh, in Ecuador. Thank you. Over to you. Great. Thank you so much. I think, Lola, uh, the slide that you had and where you showed concretely in terms of what are the institutional uh, strategies that you have adopted to actually address the intersectionality uh, within the context of the specific program um, program that you have, and I think there were some questions in the chat box. Uh, so I think this sort of brings uh, us down to the level where, you know, at the level of the program, we can really look at practically how do we actually implement an intersectionality approach. Apologies to interrupt you. Uh, we will share the slides, and if there are further questions, colleagues, please put them in the chat. Uh, with that, let me hand over quickly to Nigina because I'm keen that we have some. A uh, good time for questions and answers. Nigina, if you would like to come in and share your the experience from Moldova. Uh, dear audience, audience uh, uh, good uh, day. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to share UN Women uh, Country Office experiences on applying intersectionality into our programming, especially in the area of fighting stigma and discrimination towards uh, women with disabilities under eliminating of um, violence against women area. Um, while designing, but also implementing our programs, we are applying LNOB principles coupled with intersectionality approach, which we think is critical. Uh, this offers uh, to us the opportunity to include both needs which are not seen or are not visible in relation to general groups and programming. Uh, so I would like to highlight uh, some examples on how we did this. And uh, of course, we are now under implementation of a new project together with UNDP. And uh, we will be happy to share further uh, the experiences and lessons learned. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, first, we have to understand the needs and the profile of women with disabilities in the Republic of Moldova. And by this, I would like to mention that uh, in partnership with national stakeholders and the other UN agencies, we developed an analytical note about the profile of women with disabilities in Moldova in order to understand their needs, but also vulnerabilities uh, and for um, informing better policies. 
as well, um, recently, uh, the government of the Republic of Moldova approved the intersectional mechanism on ending violence against women uh, and girls area with uh, a special focus on uh, women with disabilities, specifically for women with uh, mental disability, which we uh, think it's a very important step. Of course, uh, now uh, we are in the phase of uh, piloting, but also and to see what are the further gaps into the issue for the ensuring the um, uh, um, inclusive response. Uh, we also have to bear in mind that the uh, tailored programming uh, is also a good solution uh, towards uh, working with women with disabilities and also addressing their issues and including this into the overall response. Uh, and here I would mention the ongoing project that we have uh, um, implementing uh, together with UNDP Moldova country office. And um, the aim of the project is uh, to fight stigma and discrimination uh, uh, around the women with disabilities. And um, the main uh, outcome from that project, which we are expecting to achieve all together, is uh, to have strength and services for the elimination of violence against women with disabilities following evidence-based interventions and change attitudes and behaviors of right holders and duty bearers. So um, the project is uh, mainly focusing uh, and mainstreaming intersectional elements across both interventions. And what we do, I will uh, um, um, present very briefly what we do. And after that, uh, I'm ready to, to answer uh, your uh, questions. So first of all, uh, we do data collection process uh, based on jointly developed ethical standards co-created with women with disabilities and OPGs along our journey towards implementing inclusive programming. As well, we uh, do a tailored training uh, for gender consultants and OPGs to organize consultation and data collection process with women with disabilities and OPGs. As well, um, uh, we are uh, now working to uh, start the application of innovative approaches towards identification of the barriers that limit women uh, uh, with disabilities to report and access VAP services. And of course, we are expecting for this co-creation uh, uh, sessions to identify together with women with disabilities prospective solutions based on their journey on victims journey method and persona portrait and design thinking. I think this is extremely important, uh, having in mind that services are not inclusive, having in mind that they are not addressing all the vulnerabilities from this point of view. And of course, uh, we are planning to do some capacity building for both right holders and duty bearers on changing the mindset related to awareness raising approach um, uh, towards behavioral change approach. What does it mean? Is that we don't need only to speak and to advocate for that. We really need to behave as those people who understand the needs and to offer those services which are in an urgent need for women and the people with disabilities. So um, uh, the central um, focus of our intervention is uh, having women with disabilities as core uh, producers of the solutions, first thing, and also uh, the uh, duty bearers uh, who will listen, who will uh, take into consideration all those needs and also to transform those needs into uh, real concrete policies and um, uh, improve the services through these uh, very tailored interventions. Uh, thank, thank you very much and um, stand uh, ready to answer the questions. Thank, thank you. you thank you so much, Nagina. Um, so I, I think you highlighted some really important points, particularly in terms of meaningful engagement uh, of, uh, of women with disabilities and their representative organizations in, in the design and implementation process, as well as the policy dialogues. Um, and you know, it'll be interesting to hear more during the discussion segment. So uh, since we're already a bit short of time, 
uh, I would I would request um, participants to please put any questions. I know we already have some, but if there are any other questions, please add them at, at this moment to the chat box. Uh, and very quickly, I would invite Julia Braun Miller from the World Bank. She's the private sector development specialist with the Women, Business and Law program of the World Bank. Julia, if you're if you're online, would you like to come in very quickly? Yeah, thank you so much um, for you know giving us also a quick opportunity to present um, the work we do at the World Bank on intersectional discrimination and um, inclusion of women with disabilities. I'm really excited to hear these presentations. Um, Montreal, Leila, you speak about an issue that's very dear to my heart. Um, and so we are coming in a bit from that angle of um, data and evidence, um, something that you know keeps being mentioned. We need more disaggregated data to understand what works. Um, and so what we are doing at uh, Women, Business and the Law is we measure laws and regulations um, that impede or promote women's economic participation. And so it's a global project. We look at 190 economies and we have indicators that measure um, legal barriers to women's participation, you know, starting with mobility uh, to starting a job, um, starting a business, getting married, having children up until retirement. Um, but what is missing in this project, which is one of the flagship reports of the bank, is an intersectional approach. So that's why now, um, two years ago, we started um, also adding questions on women with disabilities um, to see how the laws uh, treat women differently um, and uh, women with disabilities um, differently from uh, you know men uh, and uh, women without uh, non-disabled women so we just um, published our first research brief um, on this new data uh, which highlights four areas so we're looking at non-discrimination legislation we're looking at um, parental rights, uh, labor inclusion, and protection from gender-based violence. And um, I'm sure I don't surprise any one of you if I tell you what we find are huge gaps in the law. Um, one of our main findings is that only one-fourth of economies worldwide have um, intersectional mentions recognizing multiple discrimination on the basis of disability and gender. Um, and so, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to give more examples, but I know we're very short on time. Um, but yeah, just to take this away, very few laws specifically mention the rights of women with disabilities. And here we're looking at gender legislation and disability rights laws. Also looking um, at you know the social model, so definitely having a, a human rights based approach in the research. Um, and uh, yeah, we keep developing this also to really inform World Bank operations in a similar manner that you mentioned the um, approach of you and women. Um, so yeah, just inviting you to, to download our uh, first paper and I'm happy to engage more so we can keep um, this research going. So thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. And uh, I don't know if you have already put it in. I, I see it's in the it's in the text box. So colleagues, please have a look at the link in the chat box. Uh, and thank you so much for that. Uh, I think you really mentioned something that's important that we often see missing in policies and laws, the complete absence of any mention of intersectionality and the intersectional issues and discrimination. Uh, the CRPD general comment six in, on uh, equality non-discrimination does actually provide a, a sort of a good explanation of how we should be looking at it. So for those who are interested, please do do check it out, CRPD general comment uh, six. So with that, I think it's it's a good moment and we still have about 15 or 18 minutes for Q&A and discussions. Um, and would it be possible, Eva, to have the discussion questions on the screen? Uh, and, and and so that colleagues can think about it. Uh, and you know, these uh, we thought these would be interesting questions for all of us to think about. So if you have comments in any of these questions uh, from the perspective of the work you're doing or otherwise, please do uh, feel free to you know include your responses because this is a shared learning space. Uh, please do add your comments in the chat box. But let me first proceed to some of the questions that have come up. Uh, so perhaps first to Leila, uh, there was a question asking about if you can tell us a little bit more about the LNOB marker. Um, and, you know, if you have seen uh, the any good practices at UN country team level in terms of using it. And I would also ask participants who are on the call if, you know, if you're aware of good experiences with using the marker, please include that in the chat box. Uh, Leila, over to you. 
Thank you so much. Um, so we modeled the LNOB, what we call the leaving no one behind marker, um, somehow against the gender equality marker, which we had started as UNFPA many years ago, we realized that it's it's slightly different because in the gender marker, you have different levels of coding uh, for gender mainstreaming or standalone approaches, whereas uh, with the leaving no one behind for this reaching the furthest behind uh, marker, you know, we have several different factors. So it's not just gender, it's different factors. So um, we uh, have basically attached it to our financial and reporting system for our program. So um, each time uh, a work plan is generated within what we call our global programming system, which is attached to Atlas, which is our ERP system, uh, our financial and reporting system, um, colleagues are asked to tag uh, up to three different furthest behind factors in the work plan and for specific interventions and activities. So it's it's certainly not a perfect tool. It's not a perfect science, but at least it's starting to give us a sense of in our 135 country offices, just as UNFPA, I'm not, I'm not speaking of UNCT at this point, but it is certainly something that the UNCT could look to um, for inspiration or as something to, to to learn lessons from, um, we are starting to see, or at least have some data that's aggregated against these eight factors. Um, so we can see how many of our offices are working on disability inclusion, um, how many are taking into consideration age. I mean, many of our programs do because we have a, a big focus on adolescents and youth. Um, and, and against all of those different factors that I, I showed, the eight. So it's, it's really um, a rudimentary tool at this point, but it, it is very much driven by this need to have a greater sense of some information about where we're investing and how we're taking into consideration intersectionality. And again, we're, we're providing that marker with some guidance so that our offices understand how to do it and what the importance of it is. Um, and I'd be happy to share more information, um, whatever I can share uh, publicly with, with the group here. Great, Over. thank you so much, Leila. Um, that was very helpful. And, and colleagues, as I said, you know, if you have specific experience of using the marker, it would be really useful, I think. Uh, for others on this call to learn from your experience. So please feel free to enter that in the chat. Uh, Bonjour, there was a comment uh, in the chat on, you know, uh, how can we operationalize this at the UN country team level, particularly in terms of this, the, the common country assessments as well as the strategic planning. So uh, would you like to comment on that? Sure, um, thank you very much. I think this is, this is the question of the day and we, at the UN city level, you have few strategic opportunities. One is of course the common country assessment. And then as we call it the UN country programming, which every funds and program and agencies and above all UN in country typically agree with the host government that what will happen in next four to five years with the host government. And I will give three specific examples, uh, which came from uh, UN city or UN country teams to us after we published this uh, global intersectionality toolkit, uh, because there has been a surge of demands on this, which we are very delighted to, but we are also mindful that we need to respond to the request as country office colleagues are suffering. We. In the past, we did a, uh, a meeting of UN city practitioners. And what we realized that our UN country teams are very good uh, in dealing with one or two uh, uh, set of discrimination that affecting a particular developer agenda. The moment it becomes much more intersectional, it, it really puts a lot of pressure on them given that uh, there's a lack of clarity there's a lack of capacity and also lack of outreach. And that provides challenges to build a consistent narrative across UN wide on leaving no one behind. Uh, so what we suggested to them that while designing a program, 
or developing a program uh, or projects. Definitely this intersectionality approach should be at the analytical level, uh, but also when you are developing the program budget, look at the budget and see how budget is corresponding with the, uh, your program outputs and how it really align because are you really addressing intersectional elements? Are you really addressing the identities issues? Are you really addressing the whole uh, challenges of discrimination, multiple discrimination and the agenda around privileges? Who is privileged, who is not? And the leaving no one behind or go, trying to address the furthest behind who are furthest behind and bringing them along what are the specific bottlenecks you identify? And every single country, every single UN city will come up with something different, right? So you don't expect that what is finding in Peru will exactly happen in Nepal. So that would be different. We had a conversation with, with Palestine team there. They have a Elonobi working group in Palestine and they are trying to now look at Elonobi from the angle of intersectionality. So we had a two back-to-back -back, uh, dis discussion with our, our team in Palestine, UN city colleagues in uh, OPT Palestine. And what they are trying to do that the challenges they are facing, some of the unique challenges they're facing compared to other countries, how then that relate to intersectional multiple uh, identities. So they're trying to identify identities in their development programming. And some countries might identify identities, some countries might identify multiple discrimination. The last example I will give you in Tanzania, who is now uh, trying to organize a workshop at the UN city level and looking at intersectionality and disability inclusion development, but also looking at other challenges that Tanzania are facing, how their existing projects, which have been already signed and in the implementation level, you can't change this project because you are agree, you have been in a, an agreement with government. How can we sort of through the midterm review reflect intersectionality? And then of course, Tanzania is looking into how in the forward looking next programming cycle, we can start thinking intersectional way at the very beginning. It doesn't cost you much. What is important that among other UN approaches, human rights-based approach, econo political economy analysis, you combine intersectionality. So we are not advocating for a whole new agenda. What we are seeing within the limited resources, can you please connect the dots? Can you please adapt this principle? That's why we also produce this global toolkit. Our next step is all the demands that we are receiving from UN cities. We will try to come up with a operational guide as a follow-up publication. So watch out for that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Manjuro. Uh, and if it's possible to provide an email address where you know colleague participants can reach out to following uh, in case that's for the interest to know more or to do more. Um, uh, we have a, we have about seven minutes left, so I would like to quickly give the floor um, to a colleague from uh, Nepal, Lakshmi, uh, if you would like to unmute yourself and make a very quick brief in, uh, intervention. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm Lakshmi from Nepal, and I just uh, joined uh, UNV as a UNV specialist, and I'll be looking for the disability inclusion for the entire year. So I just wanted to uh, take this floor to say that like, uh, information accessibility is one of the major point that we need to work especially when we talk about inclusion and empowerment of persons with disabilities and within even the UN system like so many online portals that we are using has not been uh, fully accessible uh, yet from a different perspective and uh, we need to work more on enhancing the information accessibility especially by following the a web content access accessibility okay. guidelines. So I just wanted to highlight uh, this point and thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, and actually one of the enablers, uh, Monjul mentioned the eight enablers in the intersectionality toolkit and resource guide. Uh, one of the enabler actually looks at, um, you know, universal design of all our policies, programs, environment services. So I would encourage uh, colleagues to go and read the guide. Uh, because it will give you useful ways to move ahead uh, in applying a more intersectional approach. Uh, there was another colleague who had raised their hand. Is it, Mus I think, Mustafa? Would you like to come in? Yeah. 
Yes, of course. Your voice is breaking up. We cannot hear you. Hello? Yes, we can hear. Uh, your voice is breaking up. Mohammed. Yeah, I'm Mohammed Musa from Sudan. Yes, please, please go ahead, Mohammed. And if you could keep it brief, because I actually, we're almost yes. running out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Only guess my, I had a question. I, uh, I guess, especially about the people with disability in Sudan here, uh, especially people with, uh, you know, whom they don't have a formal education, they don't got the formal education. So I made uh, some research which I need to share with you seriously. So, I guess I'm asking uh, on how can I share it with you all? Sure. So our colleagues from the IPPN network will respond to you in the chat. Um, and, you know, there is an IPPN email address. Uh, so I think that would be would be the space for you to share share that. Um, so I think we're almost at the end end of the segment. But before I sort of hand over to Monjrul uh, to close the discussion for today, uh, I, I think it, it would be interesting to hear from Nagina and from Lola very quickly. Um, how did you find and you know whether you engaged uh, women with disabilities within the broader women's rights movement uh, and vice versa? And how did you find that interaction? Because both of you uh, highlighted quite you know the close interaction with women with disabilities and the representative organizations. So very briefly, you, if you could share your reflection. I thought uh, I think uh, it's critical, and uh, we already are doing this uh, with women uh, with disabilities, involving them in large fora, in large consultation and policy dialogues. Uh, so this. Uh, is not only through the tailored program uh, approach, but also involving them in uh, larger discussions. So their uh, needs and their voice are heard also by other uh, networks and organizations. And uh, they also take part in the high level for us when we meet uh, uh, relevant and key ministries and stakeholders in order when a policy brief is discussed or uh, an amendment of the law is uh, discussed as well. So this is, I think, a good practice and we need to explore it more, but also to leverage on, on the achieved results. Great, thank you so much, Nagina Lola. Yes, well, uh, from Ecuador, uh, I would like to say that um, indigenous women with disabilities um, don't have specific organizations for them. Um, um, in addition, uh, the uh, indigenous organizations are not always um, including enough with the women and especially with the women with disabilities. Um, then uh, we are um, uh, advocating with the, um, the authorities, the community authorities in order to include to um, the indigenous women with disabilities. And we have also um, visited in the houses of the of the families where um, the the um, women live in order to um, um, develop the diagnosis uh, to establish the gaps and the difficulties that they have to um, participate within their organization as well as to access to the GBB services. Then it is a challenge um, and I think there is a lot of work to do. However, we are uh, listening to the voices of the indigenous women with disabilities as well as of the women that take care of them that are the majority. But it is also a challenge. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Lola. So I think you know, colleagues on uh, you know during this discussion and also during their presentations have highlighted the importance of you know including an intersectional approach in our analysis of laws, policies, programs as part of the policy making, program design, but also as strategic planning processes. Uh, I think we've shared several resources that could be useful for you. Uh, to take forward the thinking further. And of course, please, I think I saw Serge has shared the IPPN email. Please share any other resources from your end that might be useful. Uh, 
Um, and, and of course, uh, as, as Nigina and Lola have mentioned, the meaningful engagement of women with disabilities, not just in targeted programs and disability inclusion, but in mainstream services and system building efforts is absolutely critical. So with that, Monjul, I'm going to hand over very quickly, if you can uh, wrap up in terms of what the next steps are uh, before I close the event. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you very much. I, I just want to thank uh, very briefly our IPPN colleagues, all panelists, UN City colleagues, uh, participants, host, and those particularly who work behind the scene uh, to make it a success. Thank you so much, uh, both on the uh, from UNFPA, UN Women, and UNICEF on the part of uh, those three entities who are co-organizer for this, and also all other entities who are part of the IPPN name member. Now, three things I just want to say uh, in response to Sherupa that what you have asked. One is this: please, uh, at the UN city level, widen your partnership. What I am seeing based on uh, country programming that the different movements and groups are so, uh, sometimes identified only for consultation, but there is not a follow up conversation in terms of the quality of programming and uh, also in terms of how particular UN programming are benefiting a community. The feedback loop is very weak. And that is one thing that intersectionality always emphasizes a lot that how you are, your, your community is responding. Uh, number one, and this is not a unique principle for UN. This is a key principle, but for intersectionality, this is without which it is a non-starter. Secondly, think of challenges um, of multiple, both identities and discrimination at the same time, and how it is impacting your development programming. And while thinking of that, please remember that uh, discrimination and privileges can stay alongside and therefore it is important that not only we should not box a particular groups and communities as marginalized only see what are the opportunities they might be getting but the full potential of those opportunities are not harnessed given that they are facing a series of intersecting discrimination and that is an important discovery for any UN cities as they are programming. Third is also try to see the enablers of intersectionality and apply it. And today for the sake of time, I will just uh, refer to one enabler, reflexivity, which has been identified and a, a ample example were given in the global toolkit that is available free for everyone to download and have a look. Reflexivity is important because what sometimes we don't see our as UN city and OPDs and civil society and member state, our own bias, how it is limiting our own programming and advocacy at the country level. And this is this is not easy. This is hard look at ourselves that whether our, our own ethnicity, our own linguistic representation at the country level, our own uh, uh, sort of where we belong, it can affect our programming and our ultimate target group. So this hard look is critical for intersectionality. And I would really, I really urge you to look beyond while you are doing your planning programming and do a specific session on this, identifying the privileges, identifying the sense of belongingness of your core teams so that you try to, you are aware of your own bias before you go into the analytical programming. With that, I will really uh, close my comments and appreciating deeply for IPPN for hosting this event. I hope this would not be the last event. We'll continue to build a, a block together with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Manjarul. Uh, and I think that's a call for all of us. Uh, to reflect closely on our both our conscious and unconscious biases as policy practitioners uh, in, in, in our personal lives, as well as in our work in professional spaces. Uh, and as I mentioned before, within the culture and diversity team at UNICEF and more broadly within the organization, we are taking increasingly a more critical and hard look at this and several of my colleagues are online. 
Um, I would like to thank, you know, colleagues who have worked really hard and behind the scenes to put together this discussion and the event, uh, particularly Eva from UN Women, Alessandro from UNICEF, uh, as well as a big thank you to Amarish for the international sign interpretation, uh, and also to Sarah for the closed captioning. Uh, and with that, I would like to close the meeting and a big, big thank you to the IPPN uh, organizers, uh, Nadine, as well as Search Capital. Um, have a great rest of the day uh, and look forward to continuing the conversation. Please do sign up to the IPPN network so that you can access all of the resources from today's event, the presentation, as well as the recording and other resources as you go ahead. Thank you so much um, and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you.